Loyalty. It's the foundation of any strong relationship. You give your partner your heart and stay true to them, no matter what. But trust and loyalty are things to be earned, not given away on a whim. Trusting too soon or too blindly can leave you exposed, vulnerable, open to manipulation. And when you finally see the truth, you realize you've been all alone the whole time. Wednesday, May 28th, 2014. It's a quiet spring morning in Fort Gaines, Georgia. Fort Gaines is a small town. It's located about three hours southwest of Atlanta on the Alabama border. We have about 1,300 people. It's a good, close community where everybody knows everybody. But just after 9 a.m., a local resident is taking out the trash when he spots something disturbing. He had seen a person flying face down. He runs over to see if there's anything he can do. There was blood on his clothing. He realizes the person is non-responsive, that they are indeed dead. The man immediately calls 911. Officers from both the Fort Gaines Police Department and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation quickly arrive on the scene. We're a small department. It's hard for us to do some of the high-tech crime stuff that the GBI have. When I got on that scene, my first impression, of course, was that we were dealing with a homicide. Upon inspection of the body, those initial suspicions are confirmed. When the crime scene specialist turned him over, there was a gunshot wound in the area of the upper right shoulder. Based on the condition of the victim's body, GBI agents believe he was killed within the last 12 hours. The estimated time of death was between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. that morning. They think he died right there on that dirt road. With his pockets being pulled out in the position that they were, it appeared that somebody had rummaged through them. It appeared to be an armed robbery. But soon, Investigators will discover this is no ordinary robbery. Rather, it's a deadly tale of blind devotion that pushed one woman to give up everything to protect her man. In 2014, 21-year-old Eufaula, Alabama resident Brittany Baxter was a single mother looking to make a life for herself and her young son. Brittany was born in Detroit, but we moved here to Alabama and we've been here ever since. She's a good mom. She loves her son. She had a sweet personality. She more quite laid back, but at the same time, Brittany, she's determined. Brittany got a lot of goals and dreams. She loved children. She always wanted to help people. She was always the, the person I can go to and confide in. She would always give me advice on things. Even though Brittany was a single mother, she had plenty of support from her loving family and friends. The baby father was not gonna be there for her and the child, but she knew that she had family to help her. Her best friend, Taniqua Woodard, was also there to lend a helping hand. They was best friends from high school. They was like sisters. You always see one, you see the other one. But even with the support of her friends and family, being a single mother could get pretty lonely. Now, in the spring of 2014, after almost a year on her own, Brittany felt it was time to start dating again. She wanted somebody to just understand her. She wanted just somebody just to love her for her. She was really searching for someone to take care of her, someone to love her unconditionally. It didn't take long for Brittany to find what she was searching for when she met a handsome 24-year-old man online named Lawrence Jones. 
Florence Jones lived in Fort Gaines, Georgia, on the Alabama border. Even though he lived across state lines, Brittany was more than intrigued by Lawrence's persona. He portrayed money, party life. He portrayed that to her, and it maybe seemed to her like, okay, this is the kind of life I want to live. After some online flirting, Brittany and Lawrence started dating. It wasn't long before Brittany felt like she'd found the one. They start communicating. It instantly makes her think the what if, the possibility. Like, if this guy was around, what could it be? There's chemistry, an instant type of chemistry. And she's excited by that. It's new, it's fresh. Brittany fell and fell hard for Lawrence. With Lawrence Jones, she wanted that security, that love, a bond. She wanted a family. Unlike her baby's father, Lawrence promised to provide for Brittany and her son. He painted this picture that everything is going to be fine. I got you. We're going to have a good life together. He seemed charismatic, but he also had a dark side. He was involved in gang activity, robbing, stealing. It was a way of life for him. However, even after Brittany found out what Lawrence did for a living, her feelings for him remained strong. She loved Lawrence and how willing he was to care for her and her son. No man had ever shown her so much support. He seems like he wants to do the right thing. And so that makes them very connected on a deeper level. They was there, like, inseparable. She felt like, you know, he, he has my back. He, he's going to be there for me. She's seen a future with him. Their connection became so strong, Lawrence asked Brittany to leave her Alabama home and move to Fort Gaines, Georgia, to be with him. They had only been dating two to three weeks, so it was sort of like a fast and furious thing that happened. Brittany's family was apprehensive. It was a quick process. I was very concerned, but I mean, you know, it's her choice. To put her family's fears to rest, Brittany invited her best friend, Taniqua, to move with her for support. Taniqua was all in. So in April of 2014, Brittany, her son, and Taniqua all moved in with Lawrence at his aunt's home where his cousin, 21-year-old Donovan Evans, also lived. Lawrence's aunt house had plenty of room, so she didn't mind them all staying there. Donovan, Lawrence, Taniqua, and Brittany, they were like a family. But it was the bond Lawrence formed with Brittany's son that warmed her heart the most. Lawrence uh, assumed the role of a father figure of her son. Brittany's getting the family she's always wanted. But before long, Brittany's love and loyalty to Lawrence would put her at the center of a murder investigation and send her life spiraling out of control. Police have responded to a 911 call about a dead body found on Lily Lane in Fort Gaines, Georgia. The victim has been shot once in the chest and authorities estimate he's been dead for less than 12 hours. They noticed that his pockets had been turned out, so he might have been robbed. The 911 caller tells investigators that the night before, he had heard several voices outside his home. He described to us that he heard for sure two people, possibly three. The caller says he didn't see anyone or hear any gunshots. He did, however, spot a white truck that he was not familiar with. At that point, the man went back to bed, assuming that the truck belonged to some local teenagers who often met up at a nearby abandoned trailer. It was known as kind of the hangout spot on Lily Lane. Younger people came to hang out and drink and smoke marijuana. As GBI agents turned their focus on the white truck still parked near the trailer, officers head inside it to check things out. It appears whoever was there the night before is now long gone. There was no incriminating evidence that they could tie together. Fortunately, GBI agents have better luck with the white truck. 
they ran the tag on the vehicle. Uh, the tag was coming back to a Marcus Allen's hand. They search the truck and find Marcus's military ID in the glove box. They matched it to the body and it looked very much like the same person. The victim appears to be 29-year-old Marcus Ellington. He wasn't from Fort Gaines, obviously, because I didn't know his face. I know everybody here. But what led to Marcus's tragic death? The investigation will soon lead authorities to a young girl blinded by her loyalty to her man. Brittany was desperate for love, and she was willing to do whatever it took to feel that love. Twenty-one-year-old Brittany Baxter had fallen hard and fast for 24-year-old Lawrence Jones and moved in with him after only two weeks of dating. Lawrence and Brittany were having the time of their life. Brittany was the type of person that loved. She loved hard. Lawrence had a criminal record. He had been involved in really dangerous activities for quite some time. But Lawrence's criminal background was overshadowed by the affection he showed Brittany and her son. That made her more attracted to him. She gonna roll with him, and she gonna do what he say do. She just wanted a happiness. She did really have feelings for him. She loved him. I believe she trusted him. Brittany believed she'd found true love with Lawrence but she had no idea the price she'd pay to stand by him. In Brittany's new hometown of Fort Gaines, Georgia, police are investigating the murder of 29-year-old Marcus Ellington, who was found shot to death on an isolated country road. According to the 911 caller, the night before the murder, he'd heard what he believed were a trio of young people hanging out at a nearby trailer. Police were thinking that Marcus had parked his truck in the road before going into the house. It's an abandoned house. It's a place that people sell drugs and they do all sorts of things that they want to keep under the radar. While the search of the trailer yielded no new evidence, authorities hope Marcus's family might know who he had been hanging out with the night before. they pay a visit to Marcus's family home, roughly 30 minutes away from the crime scene, and deliver the terrible news. The now police have the hardest part of their job, which is to notify Marcus's family that he'd been killed. Marcus's family is devastated. He wasn't a troublemaker or anything like that. His ambition was to become a truck driver. He had got accepted into truck driving school. Investigators ask, why was he even in Fort Gaines? I mean, did he have a girlfriend? Was he dating someone? The family says that the previous night, Marcus left the house around 11 p.m. The last thing he said before he left the house was that he was going out to Fort Gaines to, for some girl. The family doesn't know the girl's identity. Investigators hope cell phone records will tell them who Marcus was planning to meet. At the station, investigators begin combing through the call log. Investigators noticed that he started missing calls around 11.30 at night. Based on the suspected time of death, investigators believe Marcus had died prior to the missed calls. But what really strikes their attention are the texts he received not long before that. Texts of a romantic nature that mention not one, but two women. He has some texts that say they're from two girls named Brittany and Taniqua. That poses the question of who are these women and how are they related to what happened to Marcus? The number responsible for the texts traces back to 19-year-old Taniqua Woodard. We learned that Taniqua Woodard 
is the best friend of Brittany Baxter. She too is from Alabama. And when Brittany came to Georgia, Taniqua came with her. Even though neither young woman has a prior criminal record, investigators are beginning to suspect that they might be involved in Marcus's murder. They just aren't sure how. Fortunately, they catch a break when they receive a call from an anonymous tipster. She said that a whole bunch of people have been talking in the neighborhood. Fort Gaines is a very small town, and when someone is shot and killed, that news travels like wildfire. She said that she saw two young ladies at the local store with the guy that was shot. Investigators press the caller for more details about the women, which prompts her to abruptly hang up. The tipster did not elaborate. Could the two young women described by the caller be Brittany and Taniqua, the same two women mentioned in Marcus's text messages prior to his death? There is only one way to know for sure. Investigators need to visit the store to see if the surveillance video captured the two women. Fort Gaines doesn't have a whole lot of stores, so it didn't take a whole lot of places to go before they stumbled upon that golden egg. The manager of the store allows them to look at camera footage. We could actually see part of the parking lot. 1.28 p.m. on May 27th, roughly eight to 12 hours before the murder, Marcus's white pickup truck pulls up in front of the store. Two women exit his vehicle and enter the building. They bear an uncanny resemblance to Brittany Baxter and Taniqua Woodard. Marcus is sitting in his car, and then the two women come out of the store, talk to him for a few minutes, and then they go back inside. At 1.35 p.m., the two women exit the store for the final time, get back in Marcus's truck, and leave the scene. If the women in the video are indeed Brittany and Taniqua, that means that they were at the store with Marcus a couple hours before he had been killed. They've got the phone records and the surveillance video, so it's becoming evident that Brittany and Taniqua may actually be involved. As investigators inch closer to the truth, they'll uncover the dark side of Brittany's love for Lawrence Jones. She would do whatever she could to make sure that, that man was happy. Police in Fort Gaines, Georgia, are investigating the homicide of Marcus Ellington, who was shot dead on a dirt road. He didn't even have a chance. He died right there on that dirt road on Lily Lane. Based on phone records and surveillance video, police believe Marcus met up with two women named Brittany Baxter and Taniqua Woodard right before his death. It's kind of suspicious he meets up with these girls and then wind up dead. At this point, police are pretty sure they has something to do with it. The girls are nowhere to be found in Fort Gaines. So Georgia investigators contact their families in Eufaula, Alabama for help locating them. And sure enough, they had both returned home. They know that GBI is looking for them. So once they are located, they're asked to come to the police department for interviews. I said, Bree, you need to, you need to go talk to these people, see what's going on. Now, this dedicated single mother who thought she had found true love with Lawrence Jones just weeks before, found herself at the center of a murder investigation. With her back against the wall, Brittany leaves her son with family and heads to the station to be interviewed. They walked up there, her and Tanique were both. They walked up there. My mom told me that she had went to the police department to tell about what happened, so it just kind of all hit me at once. I was lost. Investigators speak with Brittany first. She was just sitting there kind of looking wide-eyed acting a little nervous. Investigators from the GBI lay out the evidence against the two women, the text messages and the surveillance video that suggests they were with Marcus Ellington prior to his death. 
You can tell the guilt is eating away at her. Brittany tells investigators she's no killer, but admits that she knows what happened to Marcus because she was there. According to Brittany, it all started the day of the murder when she and Taniqua were out buying diapers for her son. Marcus approached the young women in his white truck and asked if they needed a ride. He saw them and Taniqua felt like he wanted to talk to them. She says that Marcus seemed nice. They rode with him over to the store. Once there, the women went inside to get the diapers. Brittany and Taniqua are in the store getting the diapers. However, she didn't have enough money. They go out to the truck where Marcus is because she needs two more dollars so Brittany will have enough money to get diapers for her baby. Marcus pulls the money out of his pocket, what she described as being a lot of money. Brittany says they went in to pay, and after leaving the store, Marcus gave them both a ride home. The video substantiated what Brittany was saying as far as the time frame at the local store. Brittany says as they were exiting his truck, Marcus gave Taniqua his cell number. Taniqua was flattered and accepted his number. Now, even though both girls had boyfriends, they didn't really want to be rude, especially since Marcus had been so nice to them. Brittany says the girls both thought that would be the end of things with Marcus. But later that night, Brittany's boyfriend, Lawrence Jones, became jealous when he found out another man had helped pay for her child's diapers. Brittany says that they met a guy early in the day who gave them a ride and some money. She admitted that he flirted with them a little, but she thought he was just being nice. According to Brittany, that's when she saw another side of Lawrence. Even though she knew he wasn't always getting his money the honest way, she hadn't really seen his jealous side until that moment. With his pride bruised, Brittany says Lawrence was furious. Lawrence is thinking, who is this guy trying to take care of my woman? Brittany says at that point, Lawrence came up with a plan. At that point in time, Lawrence Jones let it be known, we're going to rob him and we're going to get his money. Lawrence is an expert at this. He sees another opportunity to get some money, some fast, easy money, and he involves Brittany. But how did the couple's robbery plot evolve into murder? Investigators believe Lawrence's own rap sheet may hold the answer. Lawrence Jones had had a history. He was known to make money by doing robberies and selling drugs. For Lawrence, it was just an everyday walk for him to uh, be engaged in these types of activities. Lawrence was a scary guy, so it's not crazy to think that he was behind the murder. Investigators press Brittany on this theory, but soon they'll discover that despite having everything to lose, this young woman would stop at nothing to protect her man. In Brittany's mind, taking the fall was what she had to do. There were no limits to what Brittany would do for Lawrence. Less than 48 hours after Marcus Ellington's murder, police have Brittany Baxter and her best friend, Taniqua Woodard, in custody. Brittany and Taniqua had been hanging with Marcus on the day of the murder. He even gave them some money to buy some diapers for Brittany's baby. Mr. Ellington kind of flashed his money, showing them like, hey, I know you young ladies may not have much, but I got money over here. Brittany tells investigators that when she mentioned the encounter with Marcus to her boyfriend, Lawrence Jones, he became furious. Lawrence was basically like, where did you get these extra diapers from? And she says, well, there was a guy, he's at the store, he gave me money. The couple got into a heated argument. But afterwards, Lawrence came up with a plan, and he wanted Brittany's help. Lawrence, her boyfriend's like, Hey, you know, we can rob this guy. They also got Brittany's friend, Taniqua, and Lawrence's cousin, Donovan, to help them. 
According to Brittany, she thought Marcus was a nice guy who didn't deserve to be robbed. But she was torn. Lawrence had taken good care of her and her child, and she wanted to prove her love and loyalty to him. Brittany saw this as an opportunity to really show her love for Lawrence. She saw this as an opportunity to be loyal, to be significant in Lawrence's eyes. The plan was for Taniqua to text Marcus and set up a date with both women. The offer had to be enticing. It had to be something so exciting that Marcus would stop what he's doing and meet these two girls. According to the plan, once Brittany and Taniqua met with Marcus, they were supposed to take him to the abandoned trailer on Lily Lane. That house was a hotbed for criminal activity. It seemed like the perfect location to take someone to rob them. Once Marcus and the girls arrived at the abandoned trailer, Lawrence and Donovan planned to ambush him and steal his cash. Brittany says there was never a plan to shoot Marcus. No one was supposed to get hurt. All they wanted to do was rob this individual for his money. That was it. Brittany and Tanika did as they were instructed. They got in touch with Mr. Marcus Ellington, kind of flirted with him, told him what he wanted to hear. Brittany says Marcus eagerly accepted their proposal and picked them up shortly after 11.30 p.m. However, according to Brittany, once they arrived at the house, she could tell something was amiss. Lawrence and Donovan weren't hiding outside like they were supposed to be. The girls didn't know what to do, so they took Marcus inside the house and tried to play it cool. She felt pressure because of her desire to really be a good girlfriend and for this to go exactly how Lawrence wanted it to go. She didn't want to mess up. Brittany says all three sat down on a couch and started drinking. She said after hanging out for a while, it seemed like the guys weren't coming, like the plan was off. Investigators ask Brittany what happened next. But at this point, Brittany's demeanor shifts and she begins to clam up. Obviously, Brittany was withholding information and was being very dishonest. Investigators know there is more to this story, and they press Brittany to continue. She claims that eventually, around 12 a.m., two men in ski masks burst through the front door. Only it wasn't her boyfriend, Lawrence, and his cousin, Donovan. The area is pretty high in crime, and so she says that it must have been some other guys who were watching them and wanted to rob them. She had no idea who they were, that they came in, and that Taniqua and Brittany were very afraid for their lives. Investigators know this is ridiculous. They feel like she is lying and covering for her man. Regardless, investigators let Brittany continue her story. She says after the men entered the home, all hell broke loose. She sees the victim run out of the house. Brittany says that she and Taniqua took off terrified. As they're running, she hears three to four shots. And that's all she knows. They don't know what happened, didn't wait or look back to see a body drop. According to Brittany, she and Taniqua ran for more than a mile all the way back to the house where they lived with Lawrence and Donovan. Investigators pushed Brittany for the gunman's identity, but she stayed firm. Brittany maintains she has no idea who came after them or shot Marcus. It wasn't her boyfriend, and it wasn't Donovan. However, investigators feel that it was Lawrence and Donovan, and things happened differently from the way Brittany described. Her goal was to protect Lawrence at all costs. Investigators question Taniqua next, but it seems she's even more tight-lipped than Brittany. She stand by the cold, and the cold is not a snitch. But when investigators present Taniqua with the evidence against her, namely the phone records and the surveillance video, she decides to talk. 
Daniqua doing the interview, she confesses to being a part of the robbery. However, she echoes the same stance as Brittany. No one was to get hurt, and then two masked men they didn't know came out of nowhere before the robbery could begin. Regardless of their stories, Brittany and Taniqua are charged with armed robbery and murder. Brittany's family is shocked to learn of her arrest. She went to the police department, and that was it. She didn't come back. I was devastated. I couldn't believe it. As for Marcus Ellington's family, they're frustrated that the crime's alleged masterminds are still at large. We're all very shocked. I didn't know what to do, scream, cry. I didn't know. Police are confident that they've honed in on the right suspects, but making a case against the men without Brittany and Taniqua's help could prove challenging. I think both girls were afraid of Lawrence, but Brittany also loved him. She was willing to fall on the sword for him, so to speak. Will Brittany's loyalty to her man ultimately lead to her downfall? He's throwing these two girls under the bus. GBI investigators have just arrested Brittany Baxter and Taniqua Woodard in connection with the murder of Marcus Ellington. The girls confess to being involved in a robbery plot against Marcus, but they say they have no idea who killed him. The girls claim masked men shot Marcus before the robbery plot could even get underway. But investigators aren't so sure. They believe the masked men are Brittany's boyfriend, Lawrence Jones, and his cousin, Donovan Evans. Lawrence is well known in the area for his fair share of crimes. It seemed like the girls knew more than what they were letting on, like they were trying to protect the guys. I do think that Brittany was covering for her boyfriend. She never actually named him as being a person that was there. GBI investigators transport the girls back to Clay County Jail, where they can build a case against the men. In the meantime, investigators track down Lawrence Jones. But if they think they're going to get a confession from him, they're sorely mistaken. He's not having any knowledge of Marcus Ellington. He denied being involved in armed robbery or the killing of Marcus. Now, investigators knew he had to be involved, but they couldn't get anything out of him. And the fact that his girlfriend wasn't giving him up either didn't make things better. She would rather take the file and be lawyers to somebody else instead of telling on them. With Lawrence's interrogation falling short, investigators set their sights on Donovan, Lawrence's cousin. They bring him into the station for questioning. Donovan tells the police that he has no clue what the girls could have gotten themselves into, that he wasn't involved in any way. He said that he was completely innocent and had nothing to hide. He said Brittany and Tanique wrote, may have even set up Marcus. He's throwing these two girls under the bus. He really wouldn't say much more. They just kind of hit a dead end with him. Investigators have no choice but to release both Lawrence and Donovan. The biggest evidence in this case were the statements from Brittany and Taniqua and the phone records. That's what tied them to the case, but there was not evidence that tied anyone else to the case. At that point, detectives try a different approach and locate Mary Coggins, Donovan Evans' mother and Lawrence's aunt. They question her at work, hoping she'll reveal new information. Mary Coggins says that she's got these two girls that have been staying at her house. She said the girls moved in after Brittany started dating her nephew, Lawrence, who also lived in the home along with her son, Donovan. Investigators inquire about the group's whereabouts on the night of the murder. Mary said that she was watching Brittany's baby that night because the girls wanted to go out, but she didn't know where they went. Gentleman Evans' mother maintained that he was at home that night with Lawrence from approximately 11 until the next day, and that they did not go anywhere. 
But Mary says that when she woke up the next morning, the girls were gone, along with Brittany's baby and all of their belongings. Mary Coggins' statement doesn't link Donovan or Lawrence to the crime scene. Once again, investigators turn to Brittany Baxter. They offered the girls a deal, hoping that Brittany was going to turn in Lawrence. But as everyone involved in the case would soon find out, Brittany's loyalty to Lawrence was unshakable. She wanted to stand by Lawrence and just to prove to him that she was his ride or die chick, no matter what. Investigators have arrested Brittany Baxter and Taniqua Woodard for the murder of Marcus Ellington. The investigators definitely suspect that Lawrence Jones and Donovan Evans are involved in it too. Brittany said that Lawrence and Donovan were supposed to arrive to rob Marcus, but that they never showed up. Brittany tells the authorities that Donovan and Lawrence had a plan to rob Marcus but it was interrupted when two men in a ski mask shot and killed Marcus. And that Taniqua and Brittany had no idea who they were. Investigators knew the story was ridiculous. They were very confident that the two men in masks were Lawrence Jones and Donovan Evans. The mastermind of this is Jones and Evans. Brittany was covering for her boyfriend. However, with Brittany refusing to turn on her man, there's zero evidence connecting the two men to the crime, and the investigation grinds to a halt. Finally, in October of 2014, prosecutors step in and throw one last Hail Mary. They offered a plea deal for the girls if they would give up their men. It could have gotten them lesser sentences, or at least gotten the two men involved to serve time. But even with a prospect of a plea deal, neither Brittany nor Taniqua waver from their initial statement. But in October of 2014, both women do plead guilty to armed robbery in hopes of a lighter sentence. They probably thought that it would be within their best interest to go ahead and plead, if not, they could be facing maybe life in prison. Brittany Baxter and Taniqua Woodard each receive a 10-year prison sentence for armed robbery to be followed by an even heftier 30 years of probation. I grew up around these two people, so it's kind of like, it's still kind of hard to believe. I have no hate in my heart for them. They should do the time for the crime that they committed. You took a loved one, away from a family, you know, and we can't gain a life back. To this day, the two women are the only ones to be held accountable for Marcus Ellington's murder. And unless Brittany Baxter decides to change her tune, Lawrence Jones and Donovan Evans, the suspected shooters, will remain innocent until proven guilty. When it came to Lawrence Jones and Donovan Evans, there was no smoking gun. There was just a lack of evidence. Young man lost his life, parent lost the only child, and two possible murder suspects walked through the door. Today, those closest to the case are left to wonder, was Brittany's loyalty to her man worth it in the end? She meets Lawrence, she's lured in, she falls in love, and she still doesn't have the love and the relationship that she originally sought out for. Brittany ends up with absolutely nothing. If you knew that this dark side of this person existed, why did you continue on with him in the first place? Why didn't you choose better for yourself and for your son? She was very determined to show him that she was a ride or die girlfriend by any means necessary. It's hard. She was just at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. Her romantic love for Lawrence overpowered any good decision-making that may have happened. 
the greatest human desire is just to be loved. And Brittany seemed like she wanted love more than anything. Loyalty, trust, the building blocks of true love. But when your loyalty is misplaced, when your trust veers into blind faith, you realize the love you thought was true is nothing but a lie. And you wind up losing it all. Scream. Yes, you are. No, we're not. We're just chilling. No, so you, about to catch this. you guys are all like, oh my god. <laughs> that ain't our problem, boys. Can I mute John? I'm okay. mute John. Do it. He's not bringing anything to the table here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to play the game, I'm trying to entertain my own one person you... stream, okay? Who's in your stream? I have no idea. <laughs> Is it Unchained Doggo? Doggo? No. It's probably Maybe Lurks. You got Lurks. I just played a circle. Okay, can you guys tell me who Lurks is? Because I was like looking into it. Apparently, he's like a giveaway channel, but like John streams, I guess. If... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I do stream. Yeah, yes, I am streaming. If you're interested in. If you're interested in the Binding of Isaac gameplay. <laughs> like everybody is. And Mirror's Edge, where it's just gonna cut off. And... <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what happened. My computer literally just a minute stopped working. It's weird. Uh, Elijah said up. nope. <laughs> Dr. Frankenstein is my dad. We just got three out. How's it feel, Johnny? Don't well, you guys, it. I feel like you guys get enough John in my stream. Like, I don't know if you guys, like, want to put up with it. Like, donut like actually commit to John. Because, like, no, we're not the only donut. You want to know something funny? What? John has been playing PC Siege longer than me and Johnny. And we, both, and we both did better than him. Yeah. Well, I told you John is a copper at heart. I'm going to get a glass of water. A tall glass of water? Or not a Ooh, Does John nice. use face cam? No, not yet. No. He doesn't have one yet. No, my room is like super dark, so I have to get like a light or something. You could get like a ring light. I know Razor sells this uh, mic wow. that has like a ring light on it. I want it. Is um, it good? A mic? Or I can't. Facts. Why did not? What would you say, Sergio? You said mic. I meant a camera. camera. You know, you know what I meant. <laughs> yeah, that's why I said it. You mean cam. Camera with a ring light. Not I don't know if it's that it's bright that it's gonna illuminate easy. everything because his room is dark. He has like a yeah. bunk bed, so like that covers like all the light. I used and to have a bunk bed. Or is it too late? It's twelve. It might just take a little while. Does that mean I have like new cards available? I didn't even PC check. So they shouldn't have just had to like play a couple of them and then he gave it to me. I have more wire here. I'll pay back. I'm gonna go grab one here. Bruh. Well, I guess it's instantly. I hate you, John. Okay, buddy. Bruh. Okay, when you actually like hang out with John IRL, it's just too much sometimes. Mm. What do you mean it's just too much sometimes? Sometimes he's just like too much. Like, he's like, it's like hanging out with a dad. <laughs> what? Okay. John? Okay. No, no, that's not okay, I'm not a boomer IRL. You are a boomer IRL. I'm not. Okay, John, he is like 18, but he looks like he's like 45. Okay, like, but still not. It looks like he has a family. What makes me a boomer and too much? Well, hang out higher up. I think. Do I like any of these? I don't. I'm not sure yet. What makes you a boomer? He says it what sounds like I a two. That makes me too much. He's too much. Like he does like these weird voices. <laughs> what do you mean? John, okay, do, wanna, funny, do you want to do you want to hear like it. weird voices? You know what? It's just gonna happen naturally because it's funny and everyone's gonna laugh. 
You're gonna look stupid. Okay. And I care. <laughs> Bro, I'm always derp. I'm a derp like half the time. He says, stop bullying me. It's okay. John, you could take it. You make me look bad. <laughs> Where did you go? Aren't you still in the call? <laughs> yes, I am. Just like... I just You'll be... Wait, how much yeah, more two, tears do I need? Four. Ooh, I only need five more tears. Johnny came back. I'm still waiting on that emote that I can use. What should I? Okay, do you think I? Sh do you know that face that I make like IRL? Do you think I should have that as my emote? Well, you're like, I'm annoyed, so I'm gonna stare at you for a quarter of a second. Look. No, like the side face that Johnny makes, like the. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even watching your stream, but I know exactly yeah, what you just Yeah, should I do- I was thinking of that. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll do I'll it- do I'll try to, like, take a picture, like, a good picture. I'll probably, like, work on that tomorrow. Because I don't think I'm doing anything. What's tomorrow? Tomorrow's Friday, right? Tomorrow is, in fact, Friday. Okay, so I'll probably- I'll have time to do it tomorrow, because today- we're always dumb. Like we're we always plan too much stuff to do, and then <laughs> we're always dumb. <laughs> we always plan too much stuff to do, and I'm like, I want to work on this, but I never get to work on whatever. Because today, like my friend was like, "You're streaming tomorrow?" Yeah. I think let's <laughs> let's try to stream at nine. <laughs> Yeah, John? Guys, we're gonna play Lego Star Wars. Hello? Hello? Huh? Alright. Should we try to stream at 9 tomorrow, guys? If you're awake by then. Why would I not be awake at 9 p.m.? Dude, if anything, you wouldn't be awake. Yeah, if anything, it's you. We're always waiting on you to wake up. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not supposed to be the one holding you guys back. Yes, you are. You're my mod. You have to, you have to watch me at all times. <laughs> That's your job. Because you signed up for this. You said you were gonna do this with one person. Wait, what, John? Because it's way too much to handle seven people with just one. No, it, it's not that. It's just like if I touch my computer, it like lags. Oh yeah, I always forget that. And the only way I could, like, mess with chat, like, I could, like, type a few things, but, like, other than that, my computer will lag if I touch anything. I was trying to run, like, 15 applications at once. Yeah, no my reason. computer, like, it's, when I boot it up, it starts running Skype, even though I uninstalled Skype, it's still running Skype, and I'm like, and then it, it wants to run five Microsoft Edges. Even if I turn this stuff off, like, I, I turn off the, what is it, like, I know you could turn off that it boots up when you, like, start your computer or whatever, but, like, I did that, and it's so, like, is in the background, like, running. This guy's good. He's evil. He's not to be trusted. <laughs> He's one of those weird guys that like goes for like two towers instead of like the th all three. I'm real champion Dimple. <laughs> <laughs> what? He's <laughs> <laughs> reading the guy's name and then Sergio just types E. <laughs> <laughs> and he did the same thing. E. Is Sergio our friend? Oh, can someone. Blast a hole in the wall. Thanks. Maybe what do you mean? Know. You go for two towers? Is that a good strat? What do you mean? I feel like I'd rather try to get like all three. Yeah. What? What a hole? A hole in the other wall between the two bomb sites. You know, sometimes I don't like you. Maybe. Yeah, I, I guess we prank. Is he lagging? <laughs> yeah. 
I could hear him. I wish I couldn't. Bruh. I have, Don't disrespect Papa. Like I that. have like this cool picture of my cousin's dog, and like we drew eyebrows on it, and it looks like a real. It looks like it. It looks like the dog needed those Very. eyebrows. It looks like it has them already. Have you if ever? If you've never seen the dog before, or you looked at that picture, you would have believed it's eyebrows. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever like looked at a picture of like a cat, and you're like, "Where's its eyebrows?" And you're like, "The cat doesn't have any eyebrows." I feel like sometimes animals, like, I feel like they need eyebrows. By the way, I killed Jeffrey. Jeffrey, Jeffrey? Star? <gasps> Jeffrey Star? <gasps> Jeffrey Star is also... Like, that was gonna... When you asked me a first theme song, I was gonna name the Jeffrey Star song, but I didn't know if you would appreciate it. <clears throat> a theme song? No. Jeffrey Star's... One of Jeffrey Star's songs. Oh. And he made music. He made music? Yeah. Yeah. He was like on MySpace. MySpace. He was like on MySpace and he made music. That was hilarious. How is that hilarious, John? You should know. This was like back in the day. Uh, there might upstairs. <laughs> earlier, John was like picking us up earlier, and Johnny was like, John drove the first car <laughs> ever made. <laughs> he said that. Wasn't oh that like God. the Ford something? Am I, am I like, am I thinking of the wrong thing? I was like no Model T. The Model T. I actually used my zap for, for good this time. Hey. See guys, sometimes I listen to what you guys tell me. You get, you're like, use the zap for this, and I'm like, okay. And I didn't use the zap for that like the first three days, but now I am. Back in John's days, they used to ride horses, but then when the Model <laughs> T came out, like, he test drove it, you know? We didn't just ride horses, we rode chariots. <laughs> Back when we used to fight each other for fun as gladiators. Gladiators? Yeah. Stop it. Back in Rome. In Rome. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, why is the lighting always like? I feel like the lighting in my house is always like so harsh. You like, know, I actually oversaw the building of the first Coliseum. <laughs> you were the one that constructed it. Yeah, I built it brick by brick myself. But everyone watched it all. John has no real talents. I could solve a Rubik's cube. That's a good. Enough oh, for me. you could cut wood. John's like a lumberjack. Like he cuts Bro, wood I for his grandma. Lumberjack. Also, yeah, he, I don't think you guys know, but he likes to, like, solve Rubik's Cubes, like, really fast. Like, he could do it in, like, five seconds. It's 12 seconds, but that's besides the point. <laughs> he hasn't quite gotten to the five-second mark yet. Not quite well the pace, but we're getting there. Yeah. He, like, he has a ton of different Rubik's Cubes. It's weird. Did I do a Rubik's Cube stream? Yeah. Get a camera. Never heard of cam. Weird. Oh, I heard that like these Logitech cameras were like good, or they're like okay for like starting. I can solve one side of <laughs> of one color on a Rubik's cube. I can't even do that. Yeah, I get confused. Like I tried to follow like this like uh, tutorial once, and like I didn't, <laughs> I couldn't get it. I have like a solve tiny Rubik's cube. Even ask me. Shaking my it's head. A That's cube. Because I'm not going to understand what you're saying, John. I taught Sergio how to do it. Kind of. He, he remembered for like a few days. <laughs> I remembered for that lesson. Yeah, for like the gym period that we were doing it. On the early release. <laughs> 25 minutes. You think? Imagine like trying to teach Sergio how to do anything. I tried to teach him, like, what some Clash Royale people do, and, like, he doesn't understand. And, like, he doesn't... He thinks it's, like, gibberish or something, like... Oh, I didn't mean to put... Gibberish. No, I didn't mean to put poison. Because, like, I tried to teach him, like, hey, don't put that one there. That guy's gonna kill you one hit. And he's like, I'll put that one there. You can't tell me what to do. I can. And I will. Fuck is right here. Other guys over here by me. It's, it's 
flips. Z. Oh yeah, apparently you could download Streamlabs on your phone. I'm like, should I do an IRL stream? Yeah, you can IRL. Yeah. If you want. Like, me and John eating pizza, and Sergio taking one bite and like...